The Holy Scriptures is God's story, his story of redemption of mankind, of how he goes about sharing that. Now, he uses people like you and I to help share that gospel. To help we become a part of the story that he's, he's put out there. And so as we study his word, <clears throat> we can learn what he has in store for us. We can learn a lot of things about him. Um, today, we're going to be just looking at a small portion of his word, a very small portion of it, to d determine what, uh, find out what he has to say to us today. And hopefully, y you will be able to hear that, uh, what he has to say. Now, the Hebrews, uh, get a little background to our story. The Hebrews were, had been um, in Egypt for about 400 years at this time. They had gone down when Joseph was the ru ruler. They were very prosperous for the first part of their uh, uh, stay there in, uh, in Egypt. But it's at one point, um, toward the end of this 400 years period, a new pharaoh came into power. And things t took a t t turn for the worse. Uh, they become in great bondage and slavery, you might say. They had to do a lot of forced labor to, in order to construct all the pyramids and the building projects that uh, the Pharaoh had planned. And so things became, uh, the living conditions became almost intolerable, just very difficult. During this latter part, Moses was born, the guy that you've heard about many times. Um, he was raised as the son of Pharaoh, and is the son, uh, as a, well, it's the son of Pharaoh's daughter, I'm sorry to say. And uh, as a result, he had the best education that Egypt had to offer, the best wisdom that e Egypt had to offer. He became a governmental official. He had a lot of things going on, but uh, he lived in luxury and power. But at the same time, his early formative years, those preschool years, he lived with his mother, one of the Hebrew people, and uh, she t gave him the foundation for his life, the foundation of who God is and all about his heritage. So you might say that... Um, he identified with both parts. He was citizens of two different groups, which were opposed to each other, very opposite. We're going to I want to read just a little bit of this history before we get into the actual pa passage today. Since Exodus chapter two kind of gives us a little bit of a background for it, also the second chapter of Act, Exodus, beginning with verses eleven through fifteen, and just gives a, a history a little bit uh, to get us remind us of who he, Moses was. It says, years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Looking all around and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you attacking your neighbor? Who made you a leader and judge over us, the man replied. Are you planning to kill us that you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses became afraid and thought, what I did is certainly known. When Pharaoh heard about it, this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. We're going to stop at that point. That gets us to where we're going to be in the next few moments. Just, he, Moses went out. He was reviewing the work progress, the progress of the work that, that had been established. He was looking to see what was going on, and he witnessed the mistreatment of one of his Hebrew brothers by one of the Egyptian past massacre. Moses did something that a lot of us do. He took things into his own hands. He said, I'll take care of this. And so he killed the Egyptian task massacre. He had to flee Egypt to avoid being arrested for murder. So he took it out and he left. So at the age of 40, he fled Egypt and went to Midian. Midian was out in the desert is it near the, in the Horeb mountain range, near Mount Sinai, in that general area. And he sat down by a well, a well owned by Jethro, who was the priest in that area. Now, I read recently that most of us Americans today, we have career changes three and four times in our lifetime. Moses was about to go through a career change. Here he had been the government official, high-ranking official in the Pharaoh's government, and he's going to become a shepherd. That is a drastic difference in careers. So during the next 40 years of his life, he worked for Jethro as a shepherd. And he had to learn the, the shepherding trade because he didn't do anything about it beforehand. Remember, he had been in the, the palace. Uh, he had to learn that. He, got mar he married Jethro's daughter. He learned patience and how to take care of those sheep. And he had a lot of time out there by himself between he and God to listen and to talk to God. 
Our story begins now at this point. This is like, he was 40 when he left Egypt. He's now 40 years later, he's been in, in with, de with death row in the chef shepherd business. He's now about 80 years old. It's a time many of us would consider slowing down or even retiring, but not Moses. God had a different plan for him. He had a, God had a plan, a new career. Uh, you might say an expedition leader or a freedom leader, freedom fighter. Chuck Swindoll writes, God's plan doesn't require a drum roll or crashing cymbals. He doesn't use neon signs blinking, get ready, get ready. Uh, today's the day I'm going to do something big in your life. No, God works in the quiet ways and just steps into ordinary life, ordinary day in, in our existence and intersects in, in us and gives us some instructions. This is what happened to Moses. It was just a regular, non-eventful day out in the desert in that mountain, Horeb mountain range near um, Mount Sinai. This 80-year-old shepherd, we probably imagine as he's out there just kicking his sandals in the sand, thinking about how hot it was, countless watching those sheep just eat that sparse grass, having a hard time finding anything. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a desert area. Nothing was growing much. And then he saw something extraordinary. Now, ordinarily, he saw, if you saw a scrub brush out there burning, it wouldn't be so bad because they, they burn up. But this was different. So bear with us. We're going to go in and listen in on some of the thoughts that Moses might have had as he experienced this. that I see up here? There's a bush. It's really burning big, but, but it's, it's not burning up. And it's, there's not any ashes. It's just flames. Let me get a little bit closer and see what I can see here. I'm having a hard time walking today. This sand just kind of gets away from you a little bit. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder what's going on there. Uh-huh. Who's speaking? Yeah, this is me, Moses. Take off my sandals. I'm on holy ground. Okay. Yes, Lord. Hmm. Did I hear you right? You said you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that you're going to free your people from bondage in Egypt, and you can take them to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Is that what you said? Well, that's a good idea. I'm sure they're going to be glad to hear that. You know, that's a, that's what you, they were been expecting that for a long time. I'm glad you're going to do that, God. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. yeah, that's good. Uh, what'd you say? You're sending me. Oh, hold on there. Whoa, 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 whoa. It was a good idea, but I'm not sure about me doing this. Uh, you want me to talk to Pharaoh and ask him to let your people go? Lord, do you not remember that I had to flee Egypt 40 years ago? And they're going to be, I'm on the most wanted list. There's, there's just, you've you got to be joking me. Surely you're not serious about this. Uh, hmm. Well, okay, besides, I, even, even if I did go, I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't know where to begin. I'm supposed to just say that you sent me. Okay, I give the, the, the Israelites, those children of Israel, those Hebrew folks, and I say, God sent me. How, how am I going to... Who's, who am I going to say he sent me? What's your name? I am that I am. So I'm supposed to go to the, the Israelites... And say, I am sent me to tell you that he has been listening to your afflictions and, and hears, heard your cries and he wants, he's going to deliver you out and he's going to ask me to do it. I'm supposed to do that. Uh-huh. And I'm supposed to, do the, to go to Pharaoh and talk to him. 
You, you know who Pharaoh is. Okay. He's not going to like this one bit. But I, he's, and I'm sure he's going to be joyous over the fact that I'm going to ask him to, lead, to take out 400, 600,000 of his people. He's free labor. Yeah, he's going to like that. Oh, you're going to smite the Egyptians and they're going to be glad to let them go. Oh, that's good. That's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Well, well, God, I'm still not sure they're going to believe me. I just, you know, who am I? But, you know, they're not going to believe me. But oh, you're going to you're going to go with me. Well, that's good. I would definitely need that. I need you to go with me. You know, to be right beside me and lead me all the way. And, and you said you're going to strike the Egypt, Egypt with miracles or something or other. Okay. What's this in my hand? Oh, oh, this is just a just an old rod. It's just, you know, I picked it up. It's just an ordinary old stick, you know. Uh, that I used to kind of ward off uh, those uh, pesky critters and and uh, and I guide my sheep. And it just helps me kind of get along too. Throw it down. Lord, I need this walking stick. Throw it down. If you say so. That is a snake. It's poisonous. It'll kill me. It's a viper. You gotta be joking. Don't I hate snakes. Pick, 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 pick it up. I don't think so. By the tail. Now, Lord, you know if you're gonna pick up a snake, you pick it up behind the head. You don't pick it up by the tail. By the tail. My old stick man. That's something. How'd you do that? <laughs> oh, I forgot you're gone. <laughs> yeah. Put my hand in my coat. Okay. Take it out. All right. It's white with leprosy. Uh, put it back in your coat. Okay. It's whole. It's clean. It's like it's supposed to be. My, those are, that's pretty good signs, God. You said you're going to be with me, right? Right. But there's still something that's on my mind. Uh, you know, I'm just not an eloquent speaker. I just don't think I could do, do that. I, the, I stutter a lot and I stammer a lot and, and there's just, the words just don't come out. You, you, I, maybe you should send somebody else. I know you made my mouth, my voice, and, and, and you said you'd be with me. That, that's all well and good, but, 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 but please send somebody else. Well, that angered God. Because Moses not only had some doubts, but he kept questioning and he wanted to send somebody else. So God did. He sent Aaron. Now that caused Moses a lot of problems later on. Because Aaron wasn't the, the one he needed to have. You see, God called Moses to a task at that burning bush. He had something specifically he wanted him to do. He wanted him to go liberate his people. The task was not easy. and It was going to be a challenge. Facing Pharaoh took a lot of courage. And imagine, just imagine going up to the, the, the ruler. Or go, imagine going up to your own president and saying something that's totally opposite from what he wanted. But especially to Pharaoh, who had the power of life and death in his hands. A Pharaoh, a leader who you're requesting to, to take out 600,000 men, plus their, the women and children. That's a, a lot of folks that's going to be taking out their, their uh, workforce. It's impossible. No one in his right mind would do that, but God asked Moses to do the impossible. To do the impossible. I thought about this, and thought, Moses must have been a Kentucky Christian <laughs> because he had every excuse he could, he could come up with. And don't we, in Kentucky, we come up with a lot of excuses also. Um, but some of Moses, you know, said, I can't do that. I'm a failure. 
uh, you know, I've been working for 40 years as Jethro's son-in-law, and I still haven't saved enough money to buy my own sheep. Uh, you know, that, it, what if I go down there and I'll be arrested and executed? You know, he came up with excuse after excuse after excuse, and we do that too. One of his excuses, he may have said something like this, sure, I used to be important, but now I'm a nobody. Um, why give me a job? Well, God calls, God's not interested in what we can do on our own. You know, I can identify with Moses. I'm not the best speaker. I stutter and stammer a lot of times to get my words to turned around. And there's a lot of things I can't do and I don't do as well. But God's not interested in that. He's not interested in what we can do. He's interested in our avail availability, what we allow him to do. Remember this old rod in the hand of Moses when he was holding like he was originally. It was just a rod. It was just a stick. It couldn't do anything on its own. But in the hands of God, it became a snake. It became, in the hands of God, it parted the Red Sea. In the hands of God, it opened waters for them to have water in the desert. Small, insignificant things or talents or abilities in God's hands become valuable. They accomplish much. God calls each of us to follow Him. And it begins with a journey of faith. Come follow me. We've talked about that so many, many times. Follow me and, and ask for forgiveness and repentance of our sins and ask, ask me to be a, your Savior and your Lord. That's a part of following Him. And that's, for us, that's not very, very big. But for God, he gave, he gave His Son's life for us. He's, and that is a very important thing. He took some small, our one step, small step of faith and He gives us eternal life. We, the church, we make excuses much like Moses. I'm going to pick on us now. We say, I'm too busy to, to go visit the lost person or the unchurched person. I'm too busy to do a ministry contact or do some ministry task. Uh, all, because after all, I've got to attend Bible study on Sunday mornings. I've got to send worship on Sunday mornings. I've got to be in choir practice if we have a choir. I've got to be in deacon's meeting. I've got to do this. I've got to be in my club meetings. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. We come up with a lot of busy excuses. Civic clubs, football games, basketball games. Got to watch those. I would like to teach a Bible study class, but you know, I just don't have time to prepare. I just don't know enough. My life is just wouldn't be a good example. I just can't do that. I would like to be uh, that mission stuff is good. That going to to uh, Mongolia that's good stuff, you know. But our, our church can't be involved in missions like that because we we're small and we just need to keep the money. We have need all of our money just to keep our th things going here. I would fill in the blank, but I would I would trust Christ with my eternal salvation, but I'll do this some other day. I'll trust Christ with eternal salvation, but I might have to give up something that I enjoy doing. So church, what's in your hand? I see a good building that's used on Sunday mornings. It could be used more times. What's in your hand? I see a Sunday school that could have more folks involved, more classes. We have the space, we can do more. Christian, what's in your hand? Is it a plan? A position, a career, a schedule, um, a gift, a talent, a situation, a sum of money, a family. What's in your hand that you're holding on to? Now God dealt with Moses with a glimpse of his power. And we've seen glimpses of his power also. But as long as Moses held on to that stick, there was no power in it. He had to let it go. He had to let it go. As long as he held on to his doubts about the true nature of God, he was just a simple shepherd. He had to take out a step of faith. But when he released it to God, God accomplished much. And there's a song that I um, sung years ago. It's an old song. It's called Little Is Much When God Is In It. Some of you may know this. The, the chorus goes, Little Is Much When God Is In It. Labor not for wealth or fame. 
There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does a place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. God's with us. When he calls us to do something, and you say, well, how does he call me to do something? Sometimes he just puts something right here, a feeling, an urge, a desire. He puts a, a burden on your heart about something or other. That's sometimes his call. I, I, you know, I, I know years ago, one of the calls in my life, it was something I couldn't get away from. It's when I felt really called to do youth ministry back in my younger days. And it's something I tried to get away from for a long time, but I kept knowing this is what, this is what you want me to do. But I've got, I've got a class, classes I teach at the high school. I don't have time. I could use some of the same excuses that Moses did. I don't know enough. I'm too young at that point. Now I'm too old. You know, we can come up with excuses. So, what's in your hand, Moses? It's just a rod. Throw it down. Christian, what's in your hand that's holding you on, that you're holding on to? Throw it down. Give it to me, give it to God, and see what will happen. What's your excuse? What's the rod you're leaning on? Whatever it is, whatever's holding you back, whether it be accepting Christ as your Savior or doing the jobs that He wants you to do, the mission He's called you to, throw it down and let God be in control. Throw it down. Throw it down. Andy's going to come and uh, close us out in our worship service this morning. But I pray and hope that you will consider what God's leading you to do. I may not touch on it, but He's ta talking to you uh, in some way or other, a, a task that he wants you to do that only you can do as well, I encourage you this morning to give in to what and, and let it go. Throw it down and let it go.